All right, today is December the 19th, and my guest is Thibaut Serlet. Thibaut is the Director of Research at the Adrianopoly Group, a firm providing intelligence on special economic zones. Today, we're going to talk about special economic zones and how they can do a lot of great things, including helping climate change. Thibaut, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thibaut, besides what I said, what else would you like listeners to know about you and your work? Um, that, that more or less covers it. <laughs> Good. What are special economic zones and why do they matter? So they're usually business parks that are geographically walled off from the countries that they're part of, and they have their own laws. Um, the, most very, the, the most famous use cases are Shenzhen in China, when China was a communist country, it had a horrible economic problems because it was illegal to operate any businesses. And what had caused these problems had been that central planners had tried to change everything at a very big scale. So they instead tried to adopt capitalism on a small scale, and it worked out and they built more zones. That Shenzhen, Dubai, much sort of a similar story where Dubai had a Sharia law for business. So they walled off this business park called the Dubai International Financial Center. And um, they allowed companies operating there to operate under a legal system that is slightly more similar to what you'd have in Europe. And as a result, although Dubai did not have oil, this is a huge misconception. Uh, Dubai instead started selling legal stability. Um, and these are very common throughout history and throughout the world. There's a, we, we open zonemap.com. Uh, we made the world's first map of every single special economic zone. Uh, we found 5,000 that we could put on a map and another 7,000 that we couldn't quite map out for various complicated reasons. So, and if you look in history, uh, the word Freeport comes from Renaissance Italy. Um, the word special economic zone comes from China in the 1980s, so it's fairly recent. But if you look, you find them in uh, the the empire of Alexander the Great, you find them in the Roman Empire, uh, you find them in medieval China, you find them just about everywhere you look. It's kind of uh, a well-kept secret in the world, right? I mean, Shenzhen, Dubai, these are big. It's almost like, you know, you'd have social media going on and you have like a Facebook and a Twitter appearing with Shenzhen and Dubai, but nobody knows social media exists. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're obscure because they're they don't exist in, in Europe and America anymore. Uh, in America, there's a few foreign trade zones, export processing zones. Oh, and um, in, uh, in, in, in Europe, there's a few export processing zones and a few have been grandfathered in in Eastern Europe, but that's about it. So we don't hear much about it because it's just not a Western thing right now. We don't use it much in the United States and Europe. But everybody, um, that I know in, you know, in, in everybody who's a little bit educated, who's from China, who's from the Philippines, who's from Vietnam, who's from the United Arab Emirates, you know, who's from the countries that have a lot of them, everybody knows about them. They, they don't know much about them, but they, they know that they're, they're there. What do people in China or in India or in places where these are well known, what do they typically think about special economic zones? Well, it varies quite a bit. What I've found is that most people view special economic zones the way that they view, uh, I, I don't know, there's nothing quite comparable, but they, they, they tend not to really care about them. It's not really on top of people's agenda. Oh, yeah, those things exist. You know, they're, they're not controversial. They're completely uncontroversial. In a few countries, um, there's some political polarization surrounding them. Uh, you find a little bit of that in Central America, a little bit of that in India. But in most countries, they're totally non-controversial. And actually, the ones that have the deep reforms that work really well are the non-controversial ones. Because the controversial ones might try something, but they'll fall apart in five or ten years. So. Okay. So they're kind of on a spectrum in terms of how deep the reform is going that they can do. Can you give us a bit of a sense of what the spectrum is or what are the different types of zones? Sure. So I'll give you some examples that are that are that are that are quite a bit different. So the most most special economic zones you'd see on our map are what's called um, export processing zones. And these are zones that are exempt from the customs area of a country. Why? 
because suppose that you want to build an automobile and the rubber is coming from, you know, Congo and the metal is coming from Germany, but you yourself are in Morocco, right? Well, every time the raw materials cross a the border, they'd have to pay a tariff. And the finished assembled car would also have to pay another tariff. So as a result, the price would be huge. So they exist to avoid double taxation by exempting products from tariffs um, that are inside of the zone so that you only pay the tariff once the final car has been assembled. Um, in countries like Germany, well, Germany has modern uh, tr digital tracking of goods. So they don't need these type of zones because Germany tracks everything so well. All businesses have them. You don't need the, 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 the walled off areas. So the, these export processing zones are disappearing as, as technology improves. Um, a little bit deeper, you have a lot of zones that have tax breaks and tax subsidies. A lot of zones with regulatory exemptions. Um, a, a lot of zones are almost completely exempt from labor laws in their home countries. Uh, then you find a lot of zones that have um, limited restrictions on foreign ownership of companies where, for example, in Oman and in the Middle East, in, in the United Arab Emirates until about two years ago, it was illegal for foreigners to own any companies from there. But you could if they were registered inside of the zone. And then you go a little bit further and there's about 500 zones, if I had to guess, we don't have concrete data on this yet, that allow you to choose a foreign jurisdiction of choice by default for all contracts in the zones. And that's quite interesting. Um, but then you go a little bit further and then you start getting into the weird territory. And these are the interesting zones. Um, South Africa legalized recreational cannabis and the neighboring country of Lesotho, which is a, a, a little enclave within South Africa, they wanted to sell cannabis, but they couldn't legalize it at the national level for political reasons. So they legalized it in the Buffalo Special Economic Zone where they got uh, Canadian cannabis companies to start growing. Um, there's a free speech zones, believe it or not, um, in, in, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, there were all of these media censorship laws, but they wanted to get big Western media companies like CNN and Bloomberg to operate. So they created several what are called uh, media free zones that were exempted from censorship laws for foreign companies. Um, there are zones that deal specifically with the arms and with the weapons industry um, that, that, that in the Philippines, a lot of what are called, uh, they're literally called military industrial complex zones, which is pretty funny. Um, but there's also uh, grassroots uh, weapons production zones where in Pakistan, there was a problem where there was all of these informal people who were making guns in their backyard and selling them to terrorists. The government's had a war on guns, you know, for many years and, it didn't work because, you know, it would just push the black market prices up and increase the rewards for building these guns. So they said, okay, fine, we'll uh, legalize it in this area. Um, and what you'll have to do is you'll have to uh, sell the guns to, you know, this, this list of people that we approve. And they, they got around it that way. And um, you have special economic zones that exist uh, for very sinister industries. You have zones that are exempt from normal policing in Laos, like the Golden Triangle. Uh, one of my colleagues, well, anyways, um, we're, 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 and, and these special economic zones are used by human traffickers. Uh, and there's, a, there, there's several women who are enslaved in broth, uh, several hundred women who are enslaved in brothels. There's wildlife smuggling. So there's a lot of very horrible special economic zones. Um, there are special economic zones that exist purely to uh, de facto um, exempt businesses from rules and regulations, although on paper they don't have any. I, I think that's actually the most common thing is that the zones that go really deep have nothing on paper, but there's some clause that says, you know, the, the Ministry of Finance can exempt you from any regulation on a case-by-case -case basis. The owner of the zones is friends with the Ministry of Finance and they'll exempt any business from anything. And those are usually quite good. So you'll find just about anything at the fringes of global governance in these zones, which is why I find studying them so interesting. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, another analogy that comes to my mind is, so imagine you have software codes, like a massive code base, and you have like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of developers who have to convince millions of people to do any small changes. So you just fork the code base or like start from scratch, right? To, to, to work around some of the problems in that code base, right? 
Yes. Mm. So a good analogy. I might use it myself. In the <laughs> good. Um, that also means, um, and, and you're a history buff that you already hinted at that they have a long history, right? So as, um, when, or what, what's kind of the genealogy of it? Since when have we been speaking of special economic zones or what's kind of the, the gen how did, how did they come about? So that that's very complicated, but here's the thing. Special economic zones are not city states. They're often confused. City states are like a city that's its own country. Think Singapore, Monaco, Liechtenstein. Um, and there've always been city states. Special, for a special economic zone, what you need is a large territorial state that has a monopoly on the use of force, kind of a, a state as defined by uh, classical scholars like Henry Kissinger, right? And you have to have an empire. And what's interesting is that whenever you have these empires that appear throughout history, you get city-states that pop up. Now, there's very poor docu poorly documented ones that may or may not have existed in antiquity, but the ones that are quite well documented appear in the Middle Ages. And here's three examples. Number one, there was a somewhat decentralized, at times, political entity called the Holy Roman Empire that was an attempt by uh, German kings to reform the Western Roman Empire. And it was, Voltaire famously joked that it was not holy because it's where the Protestants came from. It was not Roman, it was German, and it was not an empire. It was a confederation of city-states. But the Holy Roman Empire, similar to the way the OECD does today, acted city-states during the 12 and 1300s to levy minimum taxes because they wanted to prevent too much competition in jurisdictions. But the people who were exempt from this was the Catholic Church. So ironically, what you have is this phenomenon where the theocracies of the Middle Ages had more free market economics than uh, the rest of than, 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 than the rest. So the, with the church, there was these monasteries in Champagne in France. Champagne at the time in France was not known for its wine. This is before that. They were known for its trade fairs. And once a year, they would have this big open air market where people would trade luxuries long distance. Uh, silk from China, spices from India, slaves from Ireland, um, metalwork from Germany, honey from France, uh, 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 opium from Afghanistan, you know, all of these goods would be slaved, uh, traded. And um, what, what would happen is that they would be exempt from taxes. And after a few decades, by the early 1300s, the Champagne has started announcing year-long trade fairs. So that's the first sort of SEZ from a tax perspective um, in, in Europe that's well-documented, I should say. Of course, the Holy Roman Empire had a bunch of other things like free imperial cities that, that are a different rabbit hole. Um, another example from this time are the examples of the, uh, the, 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 the crusader states, where this is something that people never ask. How do you fund a crusade, Nicholas? How, how would you go about? <laughs> Let me ask you another question. What are the big costs of going on crusade? Well, you tell me. <laughs> well, so sieges aren't really fought the way Hollywood gets sieges wrong. So here's how you do a siege. I'll first tell you a bit about the mm -hmm. costs. The way that you do a siege in the Middle Age is, is, is and, and both the Christians and the Muslims during the Crusades do sieges this way. One of the most important items you need is either colored paint or chalk. Why? Because there's one brave soul who goes up to the enemy castle and starts scribbling on the stones and runs back and tries to avoid the archers and stuff. <laughs> and what, you, what, the, what the Crusaders do, what Richard the Lionheart does in the Third Crusade, what Saladin does as well, and it's very well documented, is that they then go out and put out posters. They go to every town, Christian, Muslims, pagans, whatever. You'll get one coin for bringing your little pickaxe and chiseling away at the enemy castle. So all the peasants go with the castle and start chiseling away <laughs> at the castle while the defenders try to uh, shoot them. But then as the siege gets more dangerous, the price increases, right? So there's this trope in some, uh, in some crusade poetry where they want to try to describe how dangerous the siege is. The bounty goes from one coin to two coin to three coin to four coin to five coin. You know, they're, they're showing as it gets more dangerous. So that costs a lot. And the other big cost, of course, is, is the cost of transportation. So the way you pay for a crusade, and keep in mind, 
the, the largest crusader armies have something like 5,000 men. The smallest have, you know, groups of 50 to 100 men. Um, so what they do is that they go to these merchants who are in uh, Italian maritime republics. There, at, at the time, there's Venice and Genoa, and then there's Pisa and uh, Apulia, um, which will decline later. And you get a contract, and you'll get these investors who will come in. And they will literally be buying equity in, in cities, or almost literally be buying equity. So the Crusaders will say, we'll capture this city, we'll capture this city. Uh, they have Armenians and, and Eastern Christians, and they'll be like, hey, Armenians, do you think this is plausible? And they'll say, no, they're all going to get killed. Okay, we won't fund that. No, no, you, they, they can totally take this city. This city has uh, walls that are poorly maintained. Okay, so then they will go to Rome, and they'll sign a contract using the clergy as witnesses. They will give the crusaders transportation. In exchange, if the city is captured, they get a quarter or a third or something like that of the city, or they get all the ports. So what you have because of these crusader states is that you have all of these Italian maritime republics that end up with merchant quarters that are exempt from all of the laws imposed by the crusader states that have, say, Venetian law or Genoese law that are the origin the direct genetic origin of the free ports and export processing zones of today. They come from this. So later on, a few centuries later in the 1400s, 1500s, what you'll have is, uh, so you have these, uh, these Genoese and Venetian special economic zones um, that'll appear in, in, in Acre, they'll appear in Greece, in, in, in Rhodes, all over the former Byzantine Empire as it gets pulled apart in Crete. Uh, you get some Genoese ones in Crimea, and later on the Venetians will realize, and the Genoese, well, we don't have to get, buy these from crusaders that's so dangerous, we can just buy them from the Muslims directly, you know? And so as, as the crusades start disappearing, these things continue to proliferate, except that they're directly being sold by the Muslims who are now in debt, having fought off all the crusaders and who are dealing with internal wars and steppe nomads and Mongols and Turks and stuff. So... Um, the most fascinating one of these, and it's very poorly documented, but um, th there apparently was one of these that was owned by the city-state of Genoa in Basra, Iraq. If you can see the Iraqi coast with Iran, totally separated by land from the Mediterranean, and it lasted 90 years. So there would have been three generations of Italians living, dying, and growing up in like an Italian special economic zone in the middle of medieval Iraq. Um, and this is, you know, so... That, that's quite interesting. Um, then you get the port of Livorno in Italy, where they import this idea to uh, Italy itself, because they say, well, it's really great having the, these free ports. And they coined, the, at first they're called year-long maritime trade fairs or stuff like that. But then they come up with an easier word called Porto Franco, which is where we get our, our word free port. Livorno uh, the Medici family is based out of Florence, which is inland, right? So they don't have a good port. They don't have good sea access. So they carve out the port of Livorno, and they start using that to trade the world. There's a very good scholar who's done work on this, who, I've, who I speak to quite a lot, and his name is Cory Tazzara. So if you're interested in doing an interview just on uh, Italian Renaissance special economic zones, he's the, he's the historian who does that. Um, and then they, uh, and, and, and at this port of Livorno, the most interesting thing is that they have a regulatory one-stop shop where they consolidate all of the permits that you have to get from different agencies into this single streamlined agency. Um, and the port of Livorno will play a major role in European history. Why? Because normal police of the clergy cannot enter there. So a bunch of Jews and Eastern Christians and heretics go there. And Martin Luther, when he's fleeing Italy to go back to Germany, will actually live there for a while. So, And um, there's at least uh, some historians who allege that Luther would have probably died if not for this. So if not for this one free port, uh, the Protestant Reformation would have probably taken a very different shape. So um, the model gets exported by the Portuguese, a lot of the Portuguese trading colonies in India, in West Africa. Before colonialism, you know, there's the British and Spanish model of colonialism, we have conquistadors who go and who kill everybody and conquer land. But then you have the, the Dutch and Portuguese model, which is just a direct continuation of the Freeport model, where they're, they're not conquering anyone. They're just buying little trading outposts and exempting them from local laws and spreading. So in many ways, to, 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 to make a long story short, there's continuous 
direct genetic evolution from the Champagne trade fairs to the present SEZs and um, a whole bunch of fundamental historical movements. It's not very well understood by most people, but we're driven by these. Mm -hmm. It's super interesting. Um, you already hinted also that these zones, um, they function as places where you can experiment in new forms of governance or institutional arrangements. Is, also, is that also something that you see early? I have those zones kind of been the laboratory of, of governance historically? Yes, yes. It's, it, it always is the laboratory of governance because what governments are afraid of is large-scale reform. There's realpolitik reason why governments cannot reform. Every time, you know, people always are like, well, why don't you just, you know, vote in? Uh, you hear this a lot amongst this American political party, the Republicans, you know. Any day now, we're going to vote in a Republican governor, who a uh, government that's going to cut taxes, cut regulations, and make business uh, go better. And it's completely impossible. This is never going to happen. Because behind every single tiny little minute rule and regulation, There's a whole lobby of interested people. So, and furthermore, if you tweak things, most experiments fail, right? So if you tweak things, you know, the countries that do change things rapidly on the national level, well, they're usually doing stuff that's quite stupid. For example, Russia. Russia was doing free market reforms after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but they tried to do everything big, kind of Soviet five-year plan style. And the result is that nobody knew, for example, what the stock bonds were worth. So I own 1% of a factory. Well, they haven't owned anything, you know? So what does that mean is this paper thing? They trade it for a bottle of vodka. Um, I've heard stories from, uh, from, from, from some families that I, that I know who were, who were there at the time. And the oligarchs were the people who had some money and were able to buy all of these stock bonds from the people who didn't know what it was worth. Um, And it turned out to be disastrous. So even if you're doing free market reform on a very large scale, it can also, and it was so disastrous that as a result, Russia has gone the other way and is now a complete, you know, it's gone back to being a centrally planned uh, police state. It's just no longer branded as being communist. Um, the marketing's changed, but the government hasn't. So the very smart reformers will usually try to just do really deep reforms in a very limited area instead of tweaking with the surface level, you know, 2.5% tax cut at the national level. Fantastic. Um, China is probably its own whole history, right? Um, but they seem to have done it well in terms of achieving economic development, right? So was Shenzhen really the first one or how did China de discover that kind of model and where is it today? Like when I look at the open zone map, China is like sprinkled all over the place with special economic zones. There's probably more than a thousand, right? Yes, uh, 2,500, I believe. Oh, mm -hmm. um, in fact, mapping out the Chinese zones was a real pain in the butt. But um, the, the Chinese zones are each managed by different government agencies. There's some zones that only exist at the municipal level. And then I don't know, I'm, I'm making it up because I don't know the specifics that well, but the Ministry of Finance will have one type of zone and the Ministry of Economic Development will have another. And they have names like Technology Park versus High Tech Development Park. And these are two completely different zones that ha have zero contact with each other. Um, and it's so bad that when we published Open Zone Map, um, one of the largest universities in China reached out to us and said, hey, the Chinese government doesn't know where all of the special economic zones are. Can we use your map? So the, ch the <laughs> different government agencies in China are using our map as, as the basis to find out where their own zones are, um, amusingly enough. Um, but what's often misunderstood about China, which is quite critical, is that you have all of these studies. If you look on JSTOR, Special Economic Zone China, you'll get 200 studies or 300 studies on Chinese SDCs. And like 99% of them are trying to do what's called uh, benchmarking, policy benchmarking. And they'll take the laws They'll take some economic data that's over time and they'll try to correlate the two. And it's cringy. It, it, it really makes me cringe because they'll be like, well, there's no correlation between this, you know? And they'll say, well, you know, we, can, we don't know how this works. Well, he, he, here's why. Um, he, here's one example as to why you cannot look at the data. So what China had was exceptional human beings running the zone. We're in 1980. China is 
Uh, Mao has been dead for four years. Deng Xiaoping is beginning its reforms, but China is very much branded as a communist country and no businesses want to move to China. There's one very brave, um, very brave soul. And it's, I, I forget his name, but it's the CEO of Volkswagen at the time in Germany. And he emphasizes because um, he was from Germany in the 1980s. He remembered the Holocaust and World War II. And his whole thing was that Germany went through this period of free market reforms once the National Socialist Party was removed from power in the 40s. And West Germany had this own reform. And he could see that Deng Xiaoping was, you know, he saw it kind of as like, well, now is China's Hitler. And Deng Xiaoping is now doing, you know, to what what to China, what what Germany, West Germany did after World War II. Like China's Ludwig Erhard. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So he really wanted to uh, to, uh, to 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 invest there and help him out, even though it was a huge risk for Volkswagen. Um, and another thing that he did, uh, he was it was the first major German company that published all of the documentation about its involvement in World War II. Uh, he had hired historians to uh, find out how uh, BMW had, had uh, sorry, how Volkswagen had uh, had uh, had collaborated with uh, with the German government, and he was like, okay, well, well, we've made a few tanks, and it's not a big deal. But he found out that um, they actually were lobbying the German government to set up concentration camps to use slave labor um, in in these work camps to build their vehicles, and. Um, he, he, all of the board of directors wanted him to throw away this data and burn it because it was deeply embarrassing. And he said, no, it's going to come out anyways. And he actually published it. And um, so he was, uh, he took this risk that the board of directors tried to remove this guy, but he stood fast and, and, and it ended up obviously being the right choice in the long run transparency. So he goes to China and he wants to set up some Volkswagens. He's going to uh, uh, Shanghai, which is about to be declared an open coastal city, which in 1984. Um, and what's happening is that the Chinese want all of this patents and knowledge transfer, but Volkswagen wants to hold on to all of these patents. And there's this huge clash. And finally, they do some test runs. They never solve the intellectual problem, uh, property problem, but they start setting up the factories anyways. And finally, after four years of negotiation, Everything's ready to go. The assembly, the only thing is, is the intellectual property is in the way. And after six months of intense negotiation, the, the CEO of Volkswagen, you know, is flying back and forth from Germany, goes back. They sign a contract. They've agreed that they're going to transfer nine patents to the Chinese and that, you know, everything. So, and except for these nine patents, Volkswagen keeps everything. The Chinese are happy. Volkswagen's happy. He goes back. He, and, I, and I'm just imagining this. this not, well, he sits back in his chair. Ah, what a what a hard day! And beep beep beep, he gets a phone call. Excuse me, sir. It's the Chinese negotiators. We just found out China does not have a patent system, so no patent system can't transfer any patents. Under communism, of course, intellectual property was abolished. Um, so Deng Xiaoping rushes in at the last moment, and he decides to make this this deal go through. And he says, no, 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 just put the deal on hold. We're going to make this go through. He flies to Germany. He has the German patent office send a team of experts to China. And in six months, he creates an intellectual property system from scratch for the whole country of China just to make this one deal go through inside. So it shows you the political will, right? So if you're one of these academics who's trying to compare, you know, laws with economic development, they'd be like, well, no, Volkswagen came into Germany before Germany had a patent system. No correlation. You know, that's what the data would tell you. But it shows you the immense will. So the idea that you could go to this country, right, and create a special economic zone when you have an adversarial relationship with the state and the majority of the people hate you and try to do deep reforms is absolutely ludicrous, you know. You, you, you need to have that very deep level of government support. Got it. Um, super interesting. Um, to, so where are we? So let's, I'd like to focus a bit more on the zones with like the deep regulatory autonomy or changes, right? So I had a previous podcast episode with Mark Lutter and we'll be talked about charter cities. There's also the talk in town, Balaji Srinivasan, the network state and network states. 
So how would you distinguish between the three, special economic zones, charter cities and network states? What's similar or when, where, where are they different? Well, network state is, is unrelated. Network state is like, um, he, he'd be an example of a network state from the uh, 1200s, right? You have the order of the assassins where they have a few little fortresses that are disconnected, but they have their own sort of parallel state. Interestingly enough, they were another uh, free market reform group very fascinating history there. Um, but, but the network state is the idea that you can have this community that is legally autonomous, that is divorced from geography. So it's a very good idea. And in many cases, it's actually a better idea than special economic zones for reform. Um, charter cities are simply special economic zones that instead of being business parks are very big and are the size of a city. And wherever you have special economic zones, you have charter cities. In fact, in our map, we mapped out, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30, maybe, maybe a bit less, um, charter cities that are currently open and have, you know, populations in the tens of thousands. They're, they're, they're quite common. Um, some people make the distinction by saying that they have to have quite a bit of deeper reform. But what you find is that the charter cities tend to work less well. Than the business parks. They tend not to actually succeed in the promise of reform as well as the business parks because they're more controversial. There's more central planning where, you know, if you're if a business can really plan to make a small business park profitable, even if you have businesses that are doing the central planning and the central planners are doing it for profit, well, it's a little bit better than if you're centrally planning something with not for profit. It's quite a bit better. But you still have to make many more predictions, many more bold assumptions, large capital requirements. Um, you have, uh, and many of the charter cities that do exist, that, that for example, uh, Gurgaon Cyber City, which has a population of something like 800,000 in India, and it's where Microsoft and Google and Oracle are headed. And they have a lot of on paper tax reforms, and a lot of these like, well, wink, wink, you know, I know the minister of XYZ and like, we can exempt you from stuff reforms. Um, They were actually six adjacent special economic zones that were sort of built piecemeal, zone by zone, So, we, and, and some of which were, were done by competitors and later acquired very complicated ownership history there. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the thing about charter cities is that there's no reason why if you want deep reform and you actually want to do very deep free market things, you need a charter city. You're much better off doing it in a small business park and then trying to grow it from there. It's going to be much lower capital requirements. Um, so so it's, 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 this, it's, it's this thing that's counterintuitive to people who are looking at it from the outside, I think. So you can start small in one of these business parks and then sort of get more political autonomy in the process. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's no, the, the amount of political autonomy you have, there's no correlation between the amount of political autonomy you have and the, si the physical size of the special economic zone, right? You have a lot of very large special economic zones that have huge populations in the hundreds of thousands that have very weak reforms, like, I don't know, Freeport, Bahamas, mm -hmm. right? And then you have very small special economic zones uh, like the uh, Dubai Multimodal Commodity Center that's like a skyscraper and a few little buildings um, that have very deep reforms, right? So... What you find are these Silicon Valley rich guys don't really, nobody's told them this. This is not their job, but they'll, they'll like want to invest in the cities because it sounds cool. And um, they'll say, hey, we're going to build a charter city with deep reforms. But what they don't really realize is, no, you could actually just do a business park and have even deeper reforms. You know, that, yeah, that's that. And in fact, the business parks are less controversial. A lot of these uh, libertarians have tried to do these charter city groups and Uh, charter city projects. But the problem is that if you're branding it as like, hey, all these foreign guys are going to create a city and it's totally separate from the society that exists here, there's protest, there's pushback. Whereas if they were just to do the exact same thing, but call it a, I don't know, uh, logistics manufacturing zone, but do everything the same, right? And just brand it as a logistics manufacturing zone, nobody would care. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a bit about that sort of... Um controversial history? Why are the charter cities or the bigger kind of experiments or zones unpopular? And um, how did it sort of hamper the success of some of these projects? 
Sure. So there's two examples that I'm going to, for, tra- for the big projects, there, there's two groups of people who do, who like doing this. The first are governments who do it like the Kanza Technopolis in Kenya, or maybe Niam in Saudi Arabia or stuff like this. And the second are the libertarians who, who try to do it. And these are totally different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the libertarian side of the thing. So, um, Libertarian, and I would consider myself to be, if, if you had to label me closest to a, a libertarian uh, um, uh, politically. So libertarians are people who basically believe that the free market should replace the maximum amount of functions possible that the government does. And different libertarians have different beliefs as to how much you know can be replaced. So uh, in, in the 1960s, a- Ayn Rand wrote the book Atlas Shrugged. And in Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand describes Galt's Gulch, which is this fictional area where all of the people who are productive, who are being oppressed by this totalitarian government, escape to so that they can keep producing free from this very, you know, ham-fisted authoritarian government intervention. And immediately after Atlas Shrugged was published, you started getting libertarian groups going around saying that they were going to build Galt's Gulch. And what's... And, and some libertarians like Patrick Friedman are very aware uh, that there's been a, a lot of direct continuity between the modern projects and these libertarian projects from the 60s. So here's a few of them. Uh, the first was called Operation Atlantis. And the guy who founded it is a quite interesting guy. And, and I know a lot about these projects because I actually um, tracked down and spoke to a lot of the retirees who were, who were involved in these projects. And I've, I've spoken to them at length. Um, and there's a lot of information that I have on them that hasn't really been super published yet. And that's not really known. And I'll, I'll, uh, w- once these people are a bit older and die, I'll, I'll, I'll write more about it because um, it's a bit embarrassing. But Werner Stiefler was a Holocaust survivor um, and not like a, hey, my family went to New York and survived the Holocaust. No, he was in the camps and he saw his relatives getting killed one by one by the by the Nazi regime. And what he decided to do, and, and he came to the U.S. with nothing. And from scratch, he built up one of the largest soap companies called the Stiefel Soap Company, which was later acquired by Johnson & Johnson. And actually, if you look at a lot of Johnson & Johnson soaps to this day, on the back it'll say Stiefel, you know, production, because Johnson & Johnson gets its shampoo and stuff from the Stiefel Soap Company. And he started hanging out with um, Murray Rothbard, with Ayn Rand, with all of these people. And it really resonated with, his, uh, with his, his group of friends who had both made a lot of money from capitalism and escaped Nazi Germany in their youth. And they became these like very hardcore libertarians. And he got a group of mostly Jewish fellow libertarian millionaires who decided to come together and fund these projects. And they were the first generation of Charter City pioneers. They funded um, the, the, the project that's most well known is called Operation Atlantis. And almost all of the prominent libertarians in the 60s were involved. So in 1962 to 1964, they bought a series of hotels in upstate New York and they started building a libertarian hippie commune there. They built a large geodesic dome. And I actually have... Um, some of the original documentation wrapped in tinfoil in my house in Cal- in my parents' house in California uh, from this from this with some pictures. Um, and what, what what they did is that they built these large ferro steel cement boats. And the idea was that these boats would have very deep, heavy hulls and would slowly sink into the water by the time they got to the destination, becoming an island. They park more and more of these boats and build a modular seastead. The idea is very old, right? So they, they had Operation Atlantis. One was going to be to do this. Two was to build a modular seastead. And three is that they'd come in with sand barges and turn it into this island. They'd identified this location um, called the Prickly Pear Keys, which were these sand, uh, which were, they were underwater. They were, they were a few miles off the shore of the Bahamas, but there was sand. Um, so if you were, Walking there, you could maybe at, at, under certain weather conditions, you could kind of walk their waist level, even though there'd be sea for, for kilometers around. There, there was no land, right? And, and under certain conditions, I think some of it may have been visible. So 
they try, the, the first boat that they build sinks in the Hudson Bay and uh, doesn't make it quite far. The second boat that they make um, uh, actually goes all the way out to the Prickly Pear Keys and it catches on fire. They barely put it out. There's a hurricane and it capsizes. And that's the second one. The third one also gets destroyed in a hurricane. Um, undeterred, Werner Stiefler decides to hire the sand barges and move to phase three, where they're saying that they're treasure hunting because they don't want people to know that they're building this libertarian uh, community. And they actually end up um, getting quite a bit far. Actually, if you look up the case law, look up Atlantis Development Corporation versus the United States. Um, they actually had a federal court case where the U.S. government sued them. Uh, yeah, it's called um, Atlantis Development Corporation versus United States, uh, three, uh, and, and it's uh, Fifth Circuit Court, 1967, uh, 379F2D818, if you want to look it up. But um, we also tried to do this off the coast of Florida to set up an offshore casino, once again with, with the sand barges. And the U.S. government sued them to oblivion. And it went all the way up to federal court after years of, of fighting. And the, the legal precedent that shows that you can't make offshore casinos in the U.S. within 12 miles literally comes from these libertarian seasteaders, something that I don't think any modern seasteaders have ever talked about. Um, the next attempt, they were doing it at the time of a communist insurrection um, in, uh, in, in, in the Bahamas, and there was some politics and the, the government cronies who were afraid that there was going to be some some sort of in, that they were like somehow funding the insurrectionists sent out uh, ships with the, the so the fifth attempt I think was blown up by pirates and finally the sixth attempt was in 1980 where they bought an old oil rig which once again was capsized by a hurricane so uh, there were five or six attempts and I think I've cataloged all of them um, other groups sort of forked off of this there was a guy called. Um, Michael Oliver. And Michael Oliver was a very interesting guy. What Michael Oliver was is that he was from Las Vegas, Nevada. And he realized that the Las Vegas Strip, the downtown area of Las Vegas, was going to grow into the desert. It was just inevitable at the rate of Vegas was growing. And that was the 50s was sort of the heyday of Vegas. Um, now it's a place where boomers go to sin before they die. But at the time, it was something a little bit different. And what he decided to buy was large tracts of desert land, which he electrified, and he, uh, he, he, he added the water infrastructure, the sewage infrastructure, right outside of Vegas, just sat on this electrified land like six or seven years, Michael Oliver. And sure enough, as the Las Vegas Strip expanded, major hotels were ended, ended up being built there. And it was kind of like the original Bitcoin. He had like these Bitcoin type, you know, ROIs on this land deal. And he became a millionaire, and he knew Warner Stiefler. And I've heard different accounts of how he knew Werner Stiefler, one of which was that some individuals involved in Atlantis, not the organization, but, but kind of weird people on the side, were actually running drugs from South America through Atlantis. And he thought, all of this has got to stop. Um, so he decided, you know, I can do it better. I'm actually a real estate developer. I'm not a soap factory guy, right? One trend you find is it's a lot of people who have no experience with emerging markets, with real estate development. They're, I don't know, they're, they're, they're the oil industry, they're investment advisors, they're Bitcoin people trying to build cities because they've succeeded in one area, trying to do it in a completely different area. So he, he actually had more credibility and he got together with a, a, an investment advisor called Harry Schultz, um, who was an interesting guy, who was one of the highest paid investment advisors at the time, and he would go to, I think, big banks and trading houses and sell some sort of consulting services. And there was, I forget his name, but there was a prominent lawyer at the time. Um, he got a much wider group. And in modern money, um, from what I've heard is that they've actually raised tens of, it would have, it would have amounted to tens of millions of dollars. So in, it, it adjusted for inflation. Um, and, I, and I did some math, I forget exactly how it was, but it was comparable to the, the modern charter city people have in terms of cap. It might have even been larger adjusted for inflation. And they had a nonprofit called the Phoenix Foundation that was founded in 1970, which was their own sort of startup societies foundation. I actually, 
got the idea when I heard about Phoenix Foundation of making Startup Society Foundation. Um, uh, I, there, there was the, uh, let's see, there, there were, or, or Charter Cities Institute type of think tank, right? And they had their own, and each project would have its own little management company and would raise funding for that. And they tried uh, seven or eight projects, um, all of which ended up horribly. Um, and they didn't just fail like they failed, but they actually made a lot of people quite miserable that, that they were involved in. So the first was uh, Abaco, which is an island in the Bahamas. Th these guys had deep ties in the Bahamas going back to the other projects. So they funded a separatist movement that was trying to establish its own country in the Bahamas that would become a free market enclave, um, 1971. And what happened is that things went out of control where the local leaders started rioting and burning down all the police stations and Molotoving. The military came in, several people were killed because of this, and they got mixed up in this and had to leave in disgrace. Um, and, and this is, the t and from what I've heard from the people who are involved, this is where the US intelligence agencies started infiltrating these groups um, there was a, a mercenary captain who was called, he, he was a guy who was like going to Rhodesia and Africa in the 60s and doing all of this sketchy stuff. All of these intelligence agencies started hovering around them and seeing if they could use them to mess with the Soviets. Um, they had another attempt in 1973, I believe, which was called the Minerva Project, where they found some sand barges similar to the Prickly Case a few hundred kilometers from the island of Tonga that they were going to see stem build casinos on. They had really sketchy people involved with that. Um, they, they, got, they got a little bit far, but the U.S. government had these meetings with the Tongans, told them, hey, we're going to mess with your fishing rights unless you claim this land as your own. The Tongans saying, well, <laughs> we, 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 we won't lose something in exchange for us claiming this land. So the Tongan military put their flag in. The seasteaders had a dance where, you know, every summer they'd go out with boats, put their flag, the Tongans would take it off, put theirs, and they went back and forth. Um, then another attempt in Vanuatu, and this would ultimately be the attempt that would get the Phoenix Foundation blacklisted, where the, uh, the, 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 the Vanuatu was having a civil war with Papua New Guinea. It was breaking off and becoming its own country. And one of the leaders in this conflict was this cult leader called Jimmy Stevens. And Jimmy Stevens... They actually, because they had all of these mercenary type groups, they were convinced that the problem was that they couldn't establish a monopoly on the use of force. So they actually started smuggling arms to Jimmy Stevens. And uh, 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 Jimmy Stevens ended up breaking free in Vanuatu as a country today, in part because of this. Um, but, but Jimmy Stevens was killed. Uh, if you look up Coconut War on Wikipedia, there was something like a, a two or three month long violent war with uh, I don't know, 100 or so deaths. Once again, directly traceable back to these libertarian creeps who are trying all of this stuff. And it got so bad that the uh, this lasted, I believe, until 1988 on and off. Um, and it was so bad that the U.S. government came to all of these investors. Hey, there's this law that prevents U.S. citizens from doing foreign policy on behalf of the U.S. And if you don't, um, if you don't stop, uh, you're going to get in big trouble. So a lot of them got really spooked by this and never touched. And there's a whole generation of investors that got these threatening letters. And they just, and I, and I spoke to them. I, I ran into one at a conference, you know, and he was like, I told him, he was very friendly. I'm like, hey, weren't you involved in the new country project? And he like ran away, like <laughs> left the conference. <laughs> it was so freaked out by this. Um, but then they kept trying it again. Uh, Eric Klein in the 1990s, who was uh, one of the pioneers of uh, computerized day trading, tried to uh, create something called the Atlantis Project, where they were going to get a cruise ship and renovate it. Um, and he, he didn't do anything sketchy. He just bought a cruise ship. You know, it was very, very benign. Um, I spoke to him quite a bit, and he actually was not inspired by Operation Atlantis. He was only vaguely aware of it. Um, but Eric Klein would later on get involved in the Seasteading Institute very early on, right? So, and Patrick Friedman, who founded the Seasteading Institute, was very consciously aware of all of these past attempts, was actually, you know, spoke to a lot of people who were involved. So there is direct continuity between today's charter city projects. Um, they ranged from 
amusing and inept like Atlantis to sinister like the Phoenix Foundation to goofy like the Atlantis Project, right? There's the whole the whole spectrum, right? They weren't universally sinister. But there's a, there's a long history of libertarians doing these things. And I think what we're seeing now, and each generation seems like they make a little bit more progress on the past one. But um, yeah, anyways, I, I hope that was... <laughs> yeah, very good. The other one was um, that you mentioned before is government-led attempts at some of these big problems of charter city projects like Neom. Um, well, so governments have been trying to make... One of our big projects that we're, we've partnered with the Charter Cities Institute, and um, they're making a master plan cities map, and we're doing a lot of the, 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 the data side of that project. And it's a map of every single centrally planned kind of master plan city. The most famous is probably Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. There have been dozens. You know, Alexander the Great had Alexandria built. Um, You have, uh, you have some of these cities. The problem is that these cities tend to feel sterile. Um, I, I actually have a few quotes on hand um, from, let's see. It's right here. Um, from different people who live inside of, uh, inside of these master plan cities. They have all of the examples of what you'd find with the Hayekian central planning problem. But... There's a guy who lives in Perth, Australia, a mining plant saying, you know, it's as bland as you can imagine. Um, car ownership is the highest. You have to drive everywhere. It was built in the 50s when central planners were thinking in terms of car. There's nothing walkable. It's horrible. Um, Dubai, uh, uh, this, this guy wrote to the Guardian. His name is Arad. He's 18 years old. He's saying, well, Dubai everywhere is 20 minutes away. So, yeah, there's public transportation. Yeah, there's roads. But you can't, like, walk to go to the little corner store and have a community You have to drive 20 minutes away. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the there's a lot of complaints from urbanists about these projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, what what I find so interesting uh, about um, this whole space, um, not sure I can share my screen. Yeah, so you also made this uh, startup cities map, which I also found quite interesting. Um, so that's separate from the open zone map which is here just for viewers to see on the podcast you won't be able to see that i think it's loading all of them it's only showing africa right now but here's the startup cities map and what you mentioned what's so interesting about them is that they're these laboratory for for governance innovation um and what i hope to see is that they harbor innovation in different industries right so um, this map shows cities that harbor startups, right? So these are the classic ones like a, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, these places harbor startups. And then you have the ones in purple that act in some ways like startups, like Miami is um, doing loads of things to attract startups. And then you have these green ones that almost are like startups, like Prospera, where I'm based, or Talent City in Nigeria. So these places also plan to they act like they are actual startups and they plan to harbor startups. And I think this can be very interesting in the space that I'm in, in technology, because a lot of technology is held back or overregulated in some areas. Right. So is that veering off of the course of history or is that something that there's precedent for that these zones have been used really to innovate um, instead of just, um, you know, enjoying kind of the um, tariff or export and manufacturing advantages. What do you have a history of substantially new things being created in them? Well, so the, what you have a history of is you have a history of some zones happen to attract a lot of innovation, like look at Shenzhen in China. Um, ironically, Shenzhen is an example of One of the main driving forces is that intellectual property rights are not very well enforced. So because there is this weak IP and everybody can copy everything with impunity, this leads to a lot of marginal in innovation, which is actually one of the most brilliant aspects of, of Shenzhen. There was this study where they attempted to look at like 
you know, which government policies, which universities attempted to found innovation, and they, they ended up founding, well, we think it's actually piracy that, that's, that's leading to it. Um, Some of my listeners will be reminded to episode 22, where I spoke to David Levine about IP and intellectual monopoly. So <laughs> as for these startup cities, you know, mo most of them are attempts at innovation, right? We don't really know if they'll be innovated, but what you find is that you can't really, you can have all of the aspects that lead to a Silicon Valley. You know, you can have a, you can have a beautiful area like Southern France did. You can have government incentives. Uh, a lot of places have incentives and have no business, right? You can have good infrastructure, a good location, and it just won't pick up because real innovative people aren't really, you know, driven, geniuses aren't driven by incentives the same way that everyone else is. Um, having the, the free market environment and the good infrastructure and scenic streets is a necessary but not sufficient um, thing for innovation. You can look at the most innovative cities like San Francisco, Florence in the Renaissance, and um, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, Baghdad, no, no, Isfahan in, uh, in, in the, in the uh, 10, around 1000 AD, right? And you'll find that um, it, 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 none of these things actually manage to secure the innovation. So there's a guy you should have on. I don't know if you have him. He's the market founder of Market Urbanism, and he's actually traveling to every one of the dots on our Startup Cities map and is using that as his, uh, as a, as his uh, trajectory. Uh, so Scott Bayer, I think, right? Scott Bayer, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you should have him on because he's, he's currently, I think, uh, finishing Latin America, and he's been to uh, every one of the green dots in LATAM or almost everyone, he might've missed one or two, but, um, and, and in about a year and a half full of finished traveling to every single one of these. So he can give you a much better on the ground uh, perspective. And that's the guy you'll want to talk to, to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's also my experience that people who are innovators um, seem to be attracted often to places where there's a lots of other innovators, right. Whose ideas they can, you know, cross pollinate with. Right. So going back to sort of the, um, copying or imitating part that you mentioned about Shenzhen, which is quite interesting, right? You want to have as few barriers as possible for innovation, one of which is often, you know, the patent system or restrictive laws or um, high taxes, all these things, right? So if you want to create that environment for innovation, you want to remove as many of these barriers as possible and put as many smart people there <laughs> to, or, or be able to attract them, which is probably the hardest part, right? Because people don't like to move or they probably move to the places that already have network effects, right? <laughs> the Soviet Union managed to do it by force. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Went there, it's, a, it's a town called Novosibirsk mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the Soviet Union realized that there was this network effect of intellectuals. So they built this town, gave it the incentives infrastructure, and then they had guys with guns take all of the innovators, put them on trains and force them to live in this, in this science town. And it actually, worked because you were able to to bypass the need for a network effect and for decades all of the soviet space technology was coming from it um of course it didn't work as well as you know other plans but if, if you you know there, there are very there are very extreme measures you could take, or maybe the saudis who just have a trillion dollars and it's like hey we'll give everyone on this list of very innovative people just millions of free dollars to come here you know yes yeah. You, you can force it, but I, I don't know that that really, that really manages. And I don't really think that, you know, innovation in the sense of like, hey, we're going to make all of these world changing inventions isn't really the main function of these cities. What really matters is very efficient implementation of things that already are invented elsewhere, that already exist elsewhere. And if you can, and these zones can help a lot with the implementation and with the spreading. And most rich people, most billionaires today didn't make their money from tech. You have to remember, right? Most billionaires, even in the U.S. and even in countries that have a lot of tech innovation, are in a wide variety of industries. And it's all of these other industries that are going to benefit. Um, and and you, could, you should see them more as like the things that spread the usage of tech. Um, here's the model, I think, of innovation in, in these cities. It's more Uber is based out of San Francisco or the next Uber. I'm just giving an Uber example. And a smart strategy for Uber is to talk to all of these cities first to 
get really fast exemptions from all of the laws where they can start operating or, and, and then you go from there. It's not necessarily that one of these would be the Uber HQ. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I think many billionaires came uh, about because of major innovative changes in production processes, which isn't something that is obvious from the outside as tech, but it applies the same technique of fundamentally innovating um, sort of the levers that kind of put power law dynamics on your business, right? So I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I, was, mm -hmm. I just meant that there's innovation TM and then there's innovation, right? Exactly. And it's innovation TM that's not going to, that, that's, that's not very interesting in these zones. We're yeah, yeah. On the ground. Exactly. When most people think of tech, they think of like a thing or a machine, right? Like a flying car. And that's also tech. <laughs> but a lot of, you know, tech or innovation is about processes, right? So how do you get, you know, oil out of the ground in a very efficient way? Sort of um, how do you scale the operations like McDonald's essentially innovated on branding or using franchising as a model? Not obviously tech, but uh, very obviously innovation and very obviously sort of changing um, sort of the um, uh, innovating when it comes to the business model at the time and being able to outcompete com to outcompete others and, and scale. Um, but um, so I, I love that we got to that point in the debate where we've got such a kaleidoscopic view of what these zones did historically, where they are at right now, what we have and what they can potentially do. So it's just one more illustration of sort of these zones being these laboratory um, for innovation in governance and other things. Can you talk a bit about your such your proposal, how they could help solve or combat climate change. Sure. So this is something, there are a lot of zones that are already doing very, trying out various climate change things. But what I'm proposing is something that's, that's quite a bit new and that would go in a different direction. And the problem with a lot of the climate change stuff is that it's very, you know, how should I say, authoritarian use this specific technology. Here's a great example. One of the stupidest climate change laws that's been passed is the EU is mandating that all of the plugs for phones use USB-C, which is a specific technology instead of Thunderport. And the short term, sure, it means that Apple can't like do sneaky things where they make cords that are basically the same, but, but only compatible with Apple devices. But in the long term, what it means is that if anyone has cords that, I don't know, somehow have are way less lossy for charging or charge faster or can transfer data really fast, you know, at, I don't know, 10 gigabits per second. Well, now you have to go and lobby to change the whole EU's technology. So um, the EU is locking itself in to this outdated technological paradigm by mandating specific technologies. And what you find is a lot of it is there's a lot of sticks but there's not a lot of carrots. So I have two different proposals, both of which might be quite effective. Proposal number one is that we replace the income tax with the carbon tax. Why? Because very wealthy people are going to find ways to dodge taxes. And right now, all of the money that they're spending ways to dodge taxes is going to H&R Block and uh, KPMG and, and accounting firms, and they're doing accounting tricks. And many special economic zones are tax havens that are, and look, you can do these 15% global minimum taxes, but I've, I'm, all, I'm talking to people and they're all laughing at this. Why? Because here's what's going to work. You're going to pay 15% in taxes to the zones. For each dollar you pay, you pay in taxes, you'll get a point and you'll be able to spend these points on rent and on electricity and stuff like that. So it literally, it, 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 it's good. And they'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll crack down on that and they'll find something else. It's, it's totally useful, useless. And you have to remember that the people who are writing these laws themselves don't want to pay taxes. So at the very least, the loopholes that the people who are writing these laws can always be exploited by others. Um, the, uh, the solution is that if you replace the income tax with a carbon tax, what you'll have is that you'll be able to create ethical tax havens. You'll be able to create a system where uh, uh, people can dodge the taxes by consuming less. Also, there's a lot of environmental things which cannot really be privatized. Cap and trade doesn't really work. Um, 
You cannot privatize the atmosphere because how would you establish property boundaries? And yet, if you're releasing all of this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, or you're putting all of these plastic pellets into the ocean, you're actually causing a very serious tragedy of commons that is threatening, you know, the destruction of human civilization. So the best solution is to solve both of these problems where you create ethical tax havens. Suppose that you, uh, you, you, you spent very little, you got rid of your carbon footprint. You were, you were, if you wanted to, you could still spend a lot. You just have to pay for it. You know, spend a lot of carbon, I mean. You, you could have a private jet, but a private jet would be very expensive. When you could instead invest that money in reforesting part of the Amazon rainforest and reducing pesticides from agriculture, that would be your tax haven. Um, and that's the solution. And of course, it's going to be very difficult to implement at large scale. It's mostly theoretical, but I think could be implemented in some SEZs. And one last thing is that for carbon taxes to be effective, they have to be really, really high. Like they have to be so high that it would de completely destroy the entire economy unless you also get rid of other taxes to compensate. That's that's the first proposal. So I wrote a piece for Reuters uh, last year about this, and I'm uh, probably going to write another piece for this. Uh, and I'm talking to a few zones about it, but and, and I spoke to the um, United Nations uh, Eco Parks Unit for uh, Colombia. I'm not really serious about implementing it, but more of as, a, as an intellectual exercise. An alternative as to how special economic zones could be used that would actually be implementable is the idea of a biodiversity speculation market. And here's why. Some, there's two types of ecosystems that need preservation. Some have a very high biomass, but very little biodiversity. These are marshlands, wetlands, and others have a lot of biodiversity. And think about tropical rainforests or the Swiss Alps, very biodiverse. So for the first type of ecosystem, which has a lot of biomass, this scheme will not work and I'll have to find something else. For the high biodiversity environments, like the Amazon rainforest or the coral reefs, this, could, this would totally work. So what you find is that a lot of pharmaceuticals are created through biodiscovery. For example, about 15 years ago, a research team found out that ants in Panama that lived high up on the Panama, on these trees, these tree ants, would inject their egg sacs with these natural antibiotics. And it turns out that these antibiotics were super powerful and killed a lot of currently antibiotic resistant bacteria. So they were able to produce these pharmaceuticals through biodiscovery. And you find that a lot of very effective anticoagulants uh, have been made from coral reefs. Uh, there's all sorts of pharmaceutical applications for undiscovered genomes. And one major risk of biodiversity is that if we destroy these bio very biodiverse environments, we will completely destroy the ability for future pharmaceutical markets uh, to use these genomes. And, and the problem is that a lot of these genomes are not going to be very useful for another century or two of technological development and biotech. So if we destroy all of these environments, we could be stealing you know, very useful medicine from our great-grandchildren without even knowing. Or another example is uh, computer chips. Um, UC Berkeley is now has uh, computer chips that they're growing from the brains uh, uh, of rats, where they take some rat cells and they grow circuits. Uh, this has also been done using slime molds in Japan, where you can make very basic computer chips out of this. You know, who knows what type of biotech applications will need all of these novel genomes? So my solution is that you create a special economic zone that bans all human development from a region, a reverse special economic zone. You cannot build anything here. You cannot even set foot in it, you know? And you sell a future, you create a futures market, and in 200 years, whoever is the protector of this land has a right to access all of the genomes of all of the biodiverse species that are on this land. And until then, all of the biodiversity needs to be protected, and all the protectors have to do is to protect this land and to prevent poaching, to prevent deforestation. You know, you, with some drone monitoring, I spoke to a guy called Mothership Aeronautics. Uh, you can basically, with a handful of drones once a month, at a very low minimum cost, protect these land and do what's necessary. So that's basically 
privatizing natural natural preserves or compared also archaeological sites right so kind of you have governments owning them and then sort of saying who's allowed or is not allowed and they don't you know have the incentive to um you know make it make it thrive long term but the zone could allow sort of private markets to decide hey um but you know I really like that idea. I really like both of them. Um, and it shows, hey, this is a way to try something like carbon taxes, for example. A lot of economists, including myself, like them as a potential solution because they preserve market incentives. But then you have the problem um, that I think you're drawing attention to with your research on special economic zones or economy or, or this thing very important to mention when you have these implement these changes on a very large scale, you're, they're more likely sort of, um, you know, the, you're more likely to, to be making mistakes. It's like going back to the analogy of that super big code base and having sort of millions of people tampering with it or making decisions on it. But if you do it on a small scale, you kind of make the mistakes without hurting too many people, right? So that you get the right measurements in place for carbon, you get the right amount, you can get good data points how it affects different kinds of industries, you can then scale it once it's successful to bigger and bigger um, stretches of land or or, um, or whole countries or regions, right? So that I think is a super, use, a super useful takeaway to give insight into what special economic zones are doing, that this laboratory of innovation, um, Thibault, you said you're also going to write uh, a book about that. Can you talk a bit about why you're writing that book, what it's going to be about? Can you um, sort of um, give a bit of a peek into that? Well, the, the, I, I'm about a year into the writing process or 120 pages in. Um, so I, it will probably take me another year and a half or so before I can even think about publishing it. Um, but as I write it, I'll have a lot of stories to tell that are quite useful. It's a history of special economic zones from a more human perspective, because a lot of these like policy things. But once again, the policies literally don't matter. Um, uh, it, from my experience, you know, it's all about what you can negotiate to exempt on a case by case basis. Um, and there's all of these talk about highly theoretical abstract, you know, Zones could be used to do this and that, but it ignores the fact that, like, how often do you hear these charter cities people talk about the fact that there literally was a free speech special economic zone in the UAE? You never hear about it. So, um, so really, it, it's 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 going to be to focus on real things that actually happened, and we're going to look at China, the United Arab Emirates, and the Gulf states as a as a cluster. And uh, the history of Europe, where well, I'll go more into, for example, Venice and Genoa. Fantastic. Thibaut, anything else you uh, would like to draw attention to when it comes to your work? Who are you looking for? Who should reach out to you? And how can they find you? Um, I'd actually like to draw some attention to some shout outs to some other people that are doing some interesting work. Uh, we're working with the Master Plan Cities, uh, sorry, with the Charter Cities uh, uh, Institute to make a map of master plan cities that'll be out in four or five months. It's uh, something like 100X the data of open zone map um, in terms of scale. It's, uh, it's gonna be very massive. Um, you, you should really have Scott Bayer on who's actually going to a lot of these places. Um, then I think you should try to talk to some traditional zone SEZ people. One very interesting, the most innovative of the zone organizations is called the AZFA, which is the Association of Free Zones of the Americas. And I, I recommend that my uh, that 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 your 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 viewers try to contact them and contact Maria Camela Moreno, who heads them, because they're doing a lot of very interesting work. And uh, finally, if anyone wants to connect to me personally, I accept all LinkedIn messages and event uh, requests and eventually reply to all non-spam messages. So reach out to me and I'd love to chat. Thibault, it was, Thibault, sorry. <laughs> it was so great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> great. I'm just going to stop.